Welcome to the Searching for Meaning podcast. My name is Gonzalo and I'm joined by my brother Tiago. Welcome. Greetings. And in today's episode, it's going to be book review. And this has been a long time coming um, for this book. And it's going to be The Score Takes Care of Itself by Bill Walsh. Now, for context, before we actually dive into the, the book, Bill Walsh was, I don't know if he still is, the coach for the Fran San Francisco 49ers, which is a NFL team, uh, American football team. And in a way, the book is, you know, it's a lot of him storytelling and telling what happened when he was there. But it is giving context to what he calls his, I believe, uh, standard of excellence or um, um, module of excellence, which is a a program, a system he implemented when he got there and the team was as low as it can be. And within two years, they won the Super Bowl and started what they call a dynasty, where I believe they won then five more Super Bowls in the next, I don't know if it was five years or if it was seven, eight years, but they won a lot. And in essence, it all started with focusing, you know, in what you can control and focusing as much as you can and being as strict and as excellent at those things. And then by doing those, the results eventually showed up. It was still a long time, two years, for them to show up. But it all comes from the standard of excellence. And, you know, the book talks also a lot about leadership, how to lead other people in very specific scenarios and stuff like that. Now, in this podcast, we're not going to focus so much on that. It's going to be more, and we were talking before a bit about this, mostly three, four or five things, which is going to be this standard of, standard of excellence, uh, why it's important, how we can use it in our life, how to use the assets we have, the th few things uh, or a lot of things we have good going on and how to use those as best as we can, even the things we may think are, you know, disadvantages, and then how to prepare for trouble among um, other things. Now, just as a general thing, starting out, um, I would recommend the book, but you need to know how to skim through it. I would say more of the later chapters just become a lot of, if you are leading other people and if you are in a position of where you have to manage a lot of people, then yeah, give it a go because of course it worked for him. If not, and which is both of our cases, you know, we're not responsible for other people. Um, it, it is not as relevant. It's more relevant these things because you can use it, you know, we can use it to ourselves. So um, from my part, I would suggest it more the beginning more when you focus on these things that you can use. Um, but yeah, that I would definitely recommend. Um, do you have any like first thoughts or kind of general thoughts before we dive into specifics? Yeah, I just want to say the thing that I think that the ending part was really more if you're like a football fan, an American football, because I really don't, you know, especially in Europe, no one cares about American <laughs> football. Sorry, yeah. American listeners. I'm like, I, and it's like, for us, football is soccer for you so it's yeah yeah <laughs> it doesn't even compute but i think the, the <laughs> that later part so if you're an american football fan probably if you're american you're gonna enjoy it more and the like you said the the, the concepts he has about leading a team and if you're in a position of leadership certainly go for it but i think just by by itself the the way he, he explained firstly how he he managed to put the the 49ers i think it was a team and got yeah, them up yeah. to um which to championship level is very is very helpful. I think it really um, resembles the book we have analyzed previously. The, the what's the name? The Habits book. The by James Clear. Oh, um, Atomic Habits. Atomic Habits. Yeah, because it's basically the, the same idea of you do the small stuff properly and you do get all the the right things yeah. in check and you eventually get to a place where those those small changes add up and they make a big change. And I think that's. A, uh, a lesson that's in general going to help everyone in life. I think it's something everyone underrates greatly is the, the small things we do every day and now yeah. they compound to, to what we eventually can become. Totally. And yeah, like if you guys have read Atomic Habits, I believe we have a pod yeah, we have a podcast on that as well. I'll uh, probably link it down below or up here. But yeah, it is like that standard of excellence. In a way, what happened was when he got there, they were at the lowest point they'd ever been. It was everything was a mess. Like the previous, I don't, I don't remember if it was the coach or the owner, like completely neglected all these things you have to do to build not only results, but also an organization and all that entails. And he started implementing these 
very strict standards, standards of excellence, like how to dress, how to talk, all these things that it's much easier to control and to apply it to everyone, from the star player to the guy who washes the floor and kind of show that to be a 49er means that you have to hold yourself according to these standards. And, you know, fair enough, the first year was the same. It was exactly the same result, I believe. Yeah, which must shit. have been terrifying for yeah. him, you know? He changed all these yeah. small things that probably no one wanted to do, and they still yeah. didn't get anywhere. Yeah, because it's like, and fuck, props to the owner for believing in him and allowing that. Because, um, like, if you're a soccer fan, you know how uh, soccer, football in Europe, you know how quick managers if they don't get results they get fired so like one year of, sh of bad results and for the owner to believe it's a big thing and then the second year um was better but it was still not good you wouldn't call that good um and then or yeah or the third year i believe or the second when he was there uh the one after that they won the championship something like that which is in a way it is like the atomic habits or the Kaizen uh, method, whatever you want to call it, which is like small progressive implements over time lead to big results. And all of these small things eventually did lead to the big results. Um, there were a few other things, um, and we'll get more to that, like the specifics of actually how the players play. But in essence, or, or like how we trained them, the same standard was applied. And in a way, by, by having that standard, not only on the field, but off the field, what he was saying to himself and to everyone and what everyone was saying to themselves is that we are professionals. We are excellent, as much excellent as we can be. And in a way that gives you much more of that sense of, of professionalism. Like, for example, and, and this you can apply to pretty much everyone. And even like, you know, now with a lot of working from home, studying from home, I do believe it's very easy to slack off. And to before you put your suit to go to work, now you can do it in pajamas. So you do it. But those small things that you did before and that kind of that transition from you waking up and just being normal to your professional self i do believe that is very important that kind of ritual of whatever that ritual is for you of kind of getting into that zone into that mode is super important like uh we also saw this in the book um the war of art where he says like he has this super big crazy ritual before he writes because that symbolizes to him in a way as well that now it's go time. It's time to be a professional. It's not time to complain or to find excuses or to do all this shit and be in your pajamas. It's time to actually work and work as a professional. And that to me is a big thing to, um, you know, it doesn't need, <laughs> it doesn't mean you need to follow his standard of excellence, but I do believe to have some sort of it, even if it's just a shower and, you know, meditation for five minutes in the morning really helps to kind of make that transition from, I'm just waking up, I'm chilling to, okay, it's go time, mm -hmm. in a way. And also, I think th those small changes he did that seemingly wouldn't have an impact directly in football. So like, like you said, dressing properly, uh, talking in a different manner, those aren't directly connected to, to football, but he still made them. And I think that's, that just touches on an important uh, subject. I think Jordan Peterson also t t touches on it, which is like... Kind of the, the, that quote of how you do anything is how you do everything. And if you don't, it's like if you are professional in some areas, but you aren't in others, it's easy for you to, for things to start getting mixed up. So if you, if you dress yeah. in, a, in a poor manner, it's more easy for, for you to kind of identify with that personality of someone who yep. was sloppy and doesn't care about their, their self-image. And this is something that like, like, that's why I think he made such a, a big point of, players dressing properly and talking properly and arriving on time. These, these small things are really what make the difference, especially in such a, a the level that the players are at. You know, everyone's professional. Everyone, yeah. know, everyone, know, everyone knows the basic rules of the game. Everyone kind of knows these the skill aspects of the game. But I think what makes it uh, the, the, the little differences in this later stage of the game is all these small things that set you up mentally yeah. to win the day and to be better at practice and it's kind of like what allows you to clear your mind and only have in this case football in, in your mind or if whatever it may be for for you if you have any it's the different topic you want to get better at in, in but i think it's really an underrated area you know i i myself mm -hmm. used to think this like this you know before jordan peterson really introduced the subject of like why he dressed in a suit every day and why he, he had all these strict routines that he always follows i was i was also like 
in my mind, the way I dressed didn't really have any impact in how I, how, how I was. Mm-hmm. It's one of those things that yeah. I couldn't see the value of it. But now that I actually started implementing that and I can see the difference because it's it, as ridiculous as it may seem. For example, when I get a, an haircut, I feel more productive the next day after that. I don't know <laughs> what yeah. that means or, or why that is, but I think it's just like that feeling of... The, because you look a certain way, you kind of mentally have to act a certain way. I think that those yeah. um, conscious things really have up. And for as, as as shallow and superficial it may seem, it actually helps, at least for me. Yeah, no, totally. And um, I noticed, for example, if I use a shirt, the same kind of like a button shirt, the same thing happens where it's like, yeah, yeah you feel a different way. Like not to say that this is the whole thing. Like this is a, because um, it needs to be a lot of those small things it's not like you go like if you're listening to this it's not like you're gonna go buy a, a button down shirt and now you're a productivity machine but that thing can help to give some meaning and to change how you feel to then go do what you have to do and yeah and, and it's really crazy to me how how these things work because like y- you know that in theory like if you improve one percent every day after 365 days for example you're like 3,700 times, 3,700 percent better. But it's always the thing, like you don't notice these things from day to day. And this example, I love it because it's a real life high pressure situation example. It's not like some guy on YouTube telling you 1% every day and you're going to be rich as Warren Buffett in the stock market. Mm -hmm. It's not like some bullshit made up stuff like that. It's somebody who actually applied knowingly or not about this 1% type of thing and then kind of saw the results because it went long enough now this kind of to me just shows how you know all things take time and and you know if you're listening to this and there's usually a big um what's the word a big kind of need to to kind of get results very fast or you notice something needs to change and to kind of want that immediately but it's like everything takes time and the bigger the thing you want is the more time it's going to take even if you're doing everything right that's the main thing which is even if you you start doing everything right today, certain things just take time. And we've talked about this a lot of times, but it's like uh, there's even this good quote from Toy Story, Toy Story 2, when the guy's like um, fixing the toy and one of, one, of, one of the other characters rushes behind him. is like, oh, how long is it going to take? And he just says, perfection takes time. And it does. You know, it can be doing everything right, but it does need the time as well it's not just a one singular time action it is the consistency with that quote-unquote perfection always improving upon that and so like this standard of excellence like i have not nothing nearly as as accurate as he had like he had this shit all very specified um what it meant to be a 49er uh, to be on this team but and in your case i'm not advocating that you need to have this very well-defined thing but it does help to have some definition of you know who you want to be, what you want to live accordingly, and then follow along with that. Um, Now, with that in mind, I wanted to talk here about kind of connected, just a slightly different um, path, which is he talks about when he got there to the 49ers, they also, I believe they they didn't have the most money. He didn't have the best picks for players. So he was kind of very kind of, you know, he didn't have the best resources to do his job. However, what he did was he used those resources he had as best as he could. Like he even talks about how his quarterback, like the guy who throws the ball for the others to catch and run. That's the knowledge I have of <laughs> American football. Uh, he, he couldn't throw the ball some, very far. Somewhere, some but, American football fan is cringing right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but I know because he said in the book that it is very important or was very important for the quarterback to throw the ball very far. And the further he could throw the ball, the better. And the quarterback that they had was very bad at that. He didn't, he couldn't throw the ball very far. So what he did is he developed a lot of plays uh, according to that, because even though he couldn't throw the ball very far, he was very accurate with the shorter type of passes. So what he did is he developed a lot of new plays around him playing like that, which in turn, you know, as then we've seen, he kind of changed the whole offensive of how you play American football. As he said, they went from playing checkers to playing chess because then there were much more factors at play and you had to be much better at it. But, you know, in the past, it was like, oh, guy throws ball and then they run and grab it. Now it was much more advanced 
there's much more calculations needed, much more predictions need to be made. And all of that came from him not having the best assets. And he also gives the example, which I really liked, of how post-it notes appeared, which was, you know, mm -hmm. the scientist created a glue that sticked, but not that well. And as first thing, if you're trying to create glue, that's a very shitty result to get. It's like, oh, it's kind of a the thing I don't want. But applied to this paper that you put on the wall and then you can take without leaving a mark, now that's very good. You, you were able to use this asset that may look negative and turn it into a positive thing. And in our lives, I do believe that, you know, whether we're very bad or very good, there's always things like this that we can use. Like even if you're, you know, listening, you're in a job that's very shitty and it's very stressful and you hate, you can still use that for good for yourself. Whether it is to build more resistance, for, like this example, to build more resistances to pressure, to, I don't know, to prove to yourself that you can do it, to maybe even find a way to make it less stressful and then, you know, be able to have more time on the side to find another thing. Whatever that may be, there's always kind of, not a solution, but there's always a way to use the situation as best as you can, essentially. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also an important lesson to take towards our, our daily lives is that you are going to be bad at some things. Some people are just better than other people in different areas. Yeah. And it's kind of like, like how we managed to get around the fact that this quarterback couldn't throw the ball very far. So you can you can apply that to your own life, you know. Maybe you can't uh, work for a lot of hours straight, you know. So you devise a work routine that, manage, that keeps you like working in small blocks and then take breaks, you know. It's... It's kind of working around your flaws in just the same the way the same way he did with his player. You can do that with you. If you know that you're a person that's going to be distracted a lot by the internet, you turn it off and, and you go work in a different <laughs> area of the room, yeah. which is everyone, by the way. But and so it's kind of like taking these concepts that he applies to the to to football. And if you actually think about it for a while, it really applies to to everyday life. You know how to get around your weaknesses, how to play to your strong points. Sometimes people, I guess, think that they need to fix their weaknesses, which I'm not saying that you don't need to do, because sometimes you do need to do if they're like something that's really holding your life back. But most times you can just play around it, you know. If you're not if you're not good at maths, you're not going to go into a field that requires you to be good at maths. Probably, yep. you know. And on, on, on the other end, if you're good at, like, let's say philosophy you're probably going to follow something that's related to philosophy it's kind of the same thing but taking take it, it into account your like personality traits if you're not a very naturally productive person or you can't go like you, you aren't naturally like maybe you have like these i'm, I'm not getting the word right it's not uh, like like um, adhd or yeah, something like adhd if you're like i'm not saying yeah. it because most people don't have it and it's kind of like something that's been blown out of proportion but if you let's say it's normal for people to, to not be able to focus for long periods of time yeah this is something true. that's but there are like people i know people i know that can naturally do this like friends i have from school that they could study for hours and i, n I was never able to do that and, and, and it's just playing around those different things you know what you can do and what yeah. other people can do totally and yeah and because in a way it's like i, I do believe this comes a lot from the school system, how we're taught not to get too, too like, we live in a society <laughs> here or anything like that. But um, yeah, where you're taught that you need to be kind of good at everything. Otherwise, you're a failure and you suck. And even if you're very good at something, if you're not very good at all of them, then you're shit. And in a way, it's kind of like picking your battles. You know, you're never going to be the best at everything. Most likely, you're never going to be the best at anything. But if you want to be very good at something, then that requires focus. And if you're trying that, might as well do something that you're naturally talented for. Like you were saying, you know, it doesn't mean that if you're very shitty, you have very shitty social skills, you shouldn't develop them just because you're not strong at them because you need that for a better life. But certain things, especially more professionally for speaking here or uh, pursuits you want to pursue, you know, might as well give yourself that advantage because there's always going to be a lot of problems. Even if you're very talented or not, there always, there's always going to be problems to overcome. The better you get, the bigger those problems are going to be. But it's also that thing, like, don't think that the best in the world at something have less problems than you. Like, they, they have bigger, much bigger problems. Like, if we take Cristiano Ronaldo, for example, the arguably the best player in the world, one of the best soccer players in the world, like, he has much more struggles than a player that is playing, like, kind of amateurishly, trying to 
to get professionally. Like he has to deal with all the pressure from the media, um, uncertainties about the future, getting gold and almost maybe being finished soon. Um, you know, a lot of things circumventing what he has to do. And, but he's still very good at it. And he was very naturally talented for that. But if he was, for example, trying to become a professional basketball player, yeah, he probably would never become anything worthy of mentioning the, the sports world. So here is really, I, I, it's like you were saying, it's like understanding your strengths and playing to them. That's what we're, what we're trying to talk here. And in a way, use those weaknesses to your advantage. Like, um, I think that's the big thing because I, I feel like you can circumvent them, like you can go around them, but you can also find ways to um, kind of use that in your advantage. Like if you're saying, like if you're very not productive and you know you've improved, but you're still not nearly as productive as you can, maybe you can delegate those things to someone who is, um, and you can focus on what you're better at. That maybe you know planning in general, strategizing, the creative side of things. Um, so I feel like it's really understanding that no one is perfect, and recognize that you have weaknesses and play with what you have. Um, I, I wanted to touch here on something as well. Uh, I really found that interesting, which is. I think even the name of the chapter is this, which is prepare for trouble, preparing for trouble, um, where he, he gives a situation where there were something happened in the game where it went very poorly and it's like a problem happened, but then they were still able to win it at like one second remaining or something. And he was saying that, oh, I was very stressed and very anxious, but I kind of knew that we were going to solve it because we practiced this problem in the past. Like he practiced and kind of predicted this problem could happen and found a solution for it and because in a way it, it was his responsibility to deal with it whether or not the problem appeared or if it was just very unlucky or not it was still his responsibility to deal with it and i believe that in our lives it's always up to us as well it's like always our responsibility to solve these things and a lot of times most of the times we can predict the shit that's going to go wrong like, uh, oh, maybe you know that every Saturday you go party and then you wake up super late and you don't do the thing you were going to do. But if it repeats more than once or twice, you know it's going to happen and you can solve it. It's not like you weren't lucky and you just got drunk and woke up late. So he, I really like that part because it shows you, first of all, to get responsibility. And then that if you prepare for these things, they kind of don't become a problem anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you if you make like certain contingencies for it, the Stoics actually yeah. have, um, actually talked a lot about this, which is like kind of uh, predicting the worst that could happen and getting ready for it, getting yeah. ready for the worst case scenario. And this is kind of the, the the same thing we're talking about in here, it, because even if things aren't your fault, they will always be your responsibility. I think Mark Nelson totally. talks about this. It's like if someone drops a baby at your door, like it's not your fault the baby was dropped there. But it's your responsibility to at least call like nine one one and get it sorted out, you know. And the, but the the point is that you shouldn't get caught up in whether things are your fault or not, or, because if they're happening yeah. to you and they're impacting your life, it doesn't really matter. It only matters is can you fix it and how do you fix it? And yeah. this is the, like the first step from, from where people need to come from in order to fix their problems. It's the first kind of like it's cliche, but it's like recognizing the problem is the first part and recognizing that it is your um it is in your responsibility to fix a problem and it, it is your responsibility that the problem is here and that it, for most people like most things we have if you're a, pro a chronic procrastinator it's your responsibility to fix it and to change it if you go out partying every day and, and then you wake up feeling like shit and you can't get anything done that's also in your responsibility to change you know it's any, almost anything totally. in our life is our responsibility no actually everything it may not be your fault, but it's always <laughs> yeah. your responsibility. And so, yeah, yeah, I feel like start yeah, from this point of view. It. You know, I think if people don't never get to this point, and I, I think this is the, the normal standpoint for people to say to complain. You know, even if you're like, sometimes I see the, the thing where I see this most clearly is in a car when people are driving. For some reason, when people are driving, like it's kind of like the worst from people gets out and when it's like it's where you really see how people view the world. You know, it's like if someone cuts you off and you start shouting at the person and calling them all types of names, it's like, what does that say about you and the responsibility you, blame on your, you, you place on yourself? Because when you do that, and you're saying that, basically saying that this, this person I never knew and I will never know ruined my day because they, they run over you or like they passed you through. I don't know anything about cars or, or road signs. It's like you're saying that this, this person that you don't know has control over your 
emotional state. So you're basically yeah. placing responsibility outside of you. And this is such a, like a, a basic example, but I just check the ne next time you're in a car with someone, check how they react to, the, to these types of things. Because most likely people won't place responsibility on themselves in, in this like daily scenario kind of uh, kind of thing. If someone like if you're in the line at the supermarket and it's very delayed, you also play, you also like start complaining about like <laughs> random shit you can't you yeah. have no control over. Like the the cashier is slow or the the machine is broken, like it doesn't matter. You know, you're letting totally. something outside of your control influence your mental state. And I'm not saying this like like I'm some sort of guru that has, has it solved <laughs> out and I can <laughs> control my my mental yeah. state. Like uh, this happens to me sometimes, you know, I get angry at random shit, but you need we need to recognize it, you know. We need to know that what we are getting at, what we're getting mad at is at least dumb. You need to recognize that you're getting mad and it's dumb that you're getting mad. That you're yeah. like there's no reason for you to be upset. That you can you can continue to be upset, but at least logically think about it and realize that there's no reason for this. Yeah, totally. And yeah, like um yeah, I think that's kind of all said. Uh for me like those were the main points I wanted to touch on. Uh Tiago, I don't know if you have any other points you wanted to touch on about the book. Um mm, it's just that yeah, yeah so, don't get mad over yeah, so, shit. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to finish with a quote I liked about the book. Um, kind of shows more about that first part what he, he meant which is quoting I directed our focus less to the prize of victory than to the process of improving obsessing perhaps about the quality of our execution and the content of our thinking that is our actions and attitude I know if I did that winning would take care of itself and when it didn't I would seek ways to raise our standard of performance so in a way trust the process when it doesn't work improve the process um Get some. so that's gonna be it for this podcast i uh, hope you guys enjoyed and other than that we'll talk to you next monday bye bye bye